So now we continue with the last section of this morning presentation. Uh, and we are starting with uh, Roger Malina. As for Joito, I have known Roger for a fair bit of time, and we regularly meet here, among other places. And uh, Roger Malina is an astrophysicist. Um, he's now in Marseille and uh, directing uh, the uh, CNRS uh, Center of Astrophysics in Marseille, which is one of the, this is one of his major line of work. But he also, and he's going to be talking about this today, uh, is uh, very interested in the connection between science and art, has been for a very long time, and has been director after his father of Leonardo, which is a magazine which is highly respected around the world that deals exactly with these questions. Since we are short of time, that's all I'm going to say about Roger, except I like him very much. Thank you. Uh, good, almost good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here again in Ars Electronica. I was talking to Gottfried and Christine last night. I think the first time I was here was on a jury was in 87 or 88. And indeed, as Rolf just mentioned, um, if we had predicted what would happen here, uh, we would have been wrong. Uh, it's been an amazing 25 uh, years, 20 years. Um, the last time I was here, I think, was uh, the invitation of Michael Neymark, who helped organize some of the 25th anniversary events for, for Ars Electronica. And it's just a delight to see uh, Ars Electronica shifting its focus from area to area. Wh what I want to talk today about is art science collaboration as a transgressive uh, activity. Um, as uh, Derek mentioned, I'm by a training an astronomer. My original training is in physics and optics. I'm an instrument builder. I have a very intimate relationship with instruments. Uh, and so I was very pleased uh, when Umberto uh, this morning uh, talked a great deal about the role of experiments and instruments in our way of knowing the world. Um, as Derek mentioned, over the last 25 years, I've been running the Leonardo publications and organizations and over those years, we've published the work of maybe 7,000 people who've been involved in the interaction of art, science, and technology. And that is a, a really innovative, creative community, uh, some of which come through Ars Electronica, but through other places. Um, more recently, I have helped set up a couple of uh, safe places for art, science collaboration, one in Marseille, uh, and I'm just starting on one in Dallas, Texas. Uh, and so I'm going to begin with a little bit of astronomy, but I want to draw a slightly different conclusion uh, from what we've been hearing about. So indeed, uh, we have an amazing situation where we have wonderful images of the Big Bang relic uh, radiation. Uh, you saw the W map uh, images. I think Paul Davies showed the, the, the images of the, the relic radiation, the cosmic background. What I'd like to do uh, is just play a sonification of the Big Bang, of the relic radiation. Uh, it's not sound, of course, but you take the structure of that image and sonify it. And so, listen to the Big Bang. That's an iconic sound, as iconic as that image. And as you've heard yesterday from Paul Davies, we have an amazingly coherent description of the evolution of the universe. We can actually now map uh, the evolution of structure in the universe on the largest scales from the Big Bang till today. We have an amazingly good description of that called the concordance model. Like the physicists have the, uh, uh, the, the, their model, we have a concordance model on the evolution of the universe, and it's an amazingly successful model. It describes many, many uh, incredible details. And I, what I'd like to now play for you is the sound of the first 100 million years of the universe as it evolved. What happens next? I'm going to play it again. Wonderful description of the world. It has predictive power, explanatory power. Unfortunately, uh, as Rolf just mentioned, most of the universe is dark. 
For that model to work, 95% of the universe is of an unknown nature, dark matter and dark energy. We sort of know how it behaves, but we don't have a clue of what it is. It doesn't emit light, it doesn't reflect light. As an astronomer, this is a little bit humbling. We've been looking at the sky for millions of years trying to explain what was going on, and after all of that work and all those instruments, we understand about 3% of it. Really humbling thought. Let me just show you uh, our best model of that dark matter. This is dark matter uh, simulations. It's a fiction because, of course, the dark matter doesn't emit light or reflect light, but here's the 14 billion years of the universe uh, as it evolved in its structure. Amazing predictive power. Those filaments of dark matter where they meet, we believe black holes are formed and galaxies, and indeed our galaxy is probably one of those nodes of that network of dark matter. Uh, the Millennium Simulation in Germany allows us to actually look in detail at the structure of the dark matter of how we think it is, uh, and here it is just flying through the filaments and zooming in on that uh, detailed structure. We don't know what it is, but it seems to determine the fate and evolution of the universe, and it dominates uh, the matter. We are the decoration in the universe, the matter that we're made of. And so, um, as an astronomer, I'm incredibly proud of the achievements of uh, my discipline, but at the same time, incredibly humble that we know almost nothing about the most important things in the world that we live in. And so the conclusion that I'd like to draw is that we are really badly designed to understand the universe. If you want to understand quantum mechanics, we ought to have been built at a different scale than we are now. And one of the reasons we have so much trouble with quantum mechanics is we're at the wrong scale. If you want to understand galaxies, we're really built at the wrong scale because uh, uh, the, the, there are different forces at play. Uh, and so uh, over the history of humanity, we've been overcoming the limitations of our nervous system by building various kinds of instruments. On the left, some of the stone megaliths uh, not far from Marseille where I live. Uh, on the right, uh, an image of uh, imagination of Galileo. On the left here, the uh, John, uh, James Webb Space Telescope, which will hopefully get launched in a few years if it's not canceled by the US Congress. And on the right, part of the LHC. We are really badly designed to make sense of the universe. And so indeed, the history of humanity is overcoming that limitation to try and make sense of it. But we are damn good meaning makers. Every generation, every one of us is able with very little technology to generate meaning that motivates what we do tomorrow morning and the day after. We are damn good meaning makers. And so I'm gonna take a, a little bit of an uh, extreme position here uh, from the um, territorial statement uh, by Christine Schaaf and Stalker in, in the Ars Electronica catalog. They talk about the insatiable hunger for knowledge. But are the arts and sciences really driven by the same hunger? What is this origin of this hunger that leads to curiosity? And more fundamentally, I'd like to talk a little bit about what is the ethics of curiosity. Scientists like to say that curiosity is childlike, it's neutral, it goes into the world like a child. Bullshit. The curiosity of artists is really strange. On the left, Pierre-Alain Hubert, a fireworks artist in Marseille, working with Jim Jemjewski, a nano scientist, they're making nano fireworks. Last time I was, saw Pierre-Alain Hubert, he was exploding molecules. Let me tell you, that's child's play. That's not something that scientists do. And indeed, he would never get funded. Fortunately, we hosted him in our artists and scientists uh, residence program. Top right, the work of Eduardo Koch, who you know, who's uh, inserted uh, splices from his gene in a petunia, uh, created a lot of uh, controversy about genetically modified plants. On the bottom, Marceli Roca, a street artist in Barcelona, who convinced uh, the Russian space agency through Arts Catalyst and Leonardo to take him up into zero gravity in the parabolic flight with an exoskeleton. What did he want to do? He wanted to dance with his avatar. Really not serious stuff. 
But in the process, he invented things and he drove his curiosity into directions the scientists would never have taken it. So, why should artists and scientists work together? Why should science agencies fund the work of artists? I think there are two categories of arguments and I'll explain a third category. I think you can do better science that way. I think the open discussion that we just heard about from Rolf and Joy, we need to think about in a disciplinary openness also. Better science, uh, we can justify, and there's a huge literature that, on this now, on creativity arguments, innovation arguments, and invention arguments. Statistically, if you look at the most successful scientists on this planet, out of all proportion, they engage in various kinds of artistic and cultural activity. Very deeply, they need to recontextualize their scientific work in other ways, and often this takes the, the form of artistic or cultural activity. So I think art science collaboration can lead to better science in, in some cases. It also leads to different science, because by embedding science in the larger society, and I think the answer was right, wrong this morning about scientists peer reviewing themselves, I think society needs to peer review itself, and to do that, you need to embed science differently in society at large, and that means cultural embedding and appropriation. Helga Novotny at the European Research Council calls this socially robust science. The fact that CERN did not lead to a black hole that ended the world was not due to peer review by scientists. It was not due to that process. Finally, the different science, I think, comes because of the ethics of curiosity, and I want to expand on that a little bit, because curiosity is not neutral. As a scientist, I went to MIT and Berkeley, and here's what I was taught were the ethos of scientific curiosity. Intellectual honesty, don't make up data. Integrity, don't cheat. Epistemic communism, share your data and your ideas. Organized skepticism, don't believe what tell you, people tell you until it's been checked by others. Disinterestedness, don't let the company that funded your research determine the outcome of your research. Impersonality, no cult of the Nobel Prize winner. Universality, what you discover in Linz is valid in Tokyo. Those are the belief systems of most scientists, and there's a fundamental flaw to that, and Humberto uh, this morning really expanded on some of that. The trouble is curiosity is embedded. You cannot make it into a neutral, ideal scientific curiosity. And here I have a quote, a quote from uh, uh, Umberto's uh, colleague Varela, all knowledge is conditioned by the structure of the knower. I do believe, like he did this morning, that there is an intimate relationship about what, between what we can do, know and do know and the way we're organized. To know something really new, you have to change yourself. Building CERN and the LHC is an act of self-construction. And so indeed, curiosity drives us to change ourselves and the way we mobilize ourselves in the world. Secondly, I think we underestimate very deeply how our experience impacts our ontology and epistemology. And I have a really nice, simple, illustrative quote here from Albert Einstein, which I use a lot in my talks, because I think uh, it's really, really true. The universe of ideas is just as independent of our nature of our experience as the clothes are of the form of the human body. It is really difficult to imagine things you haven't experienced. And that comes back to the comment that Joy made about MIT Media Lab and the mate culture. There's something about experience that shapes the kinds of ideas you can have. And I think that very deep connection uh, between our embodiment, our embodiment through our instruments is a very deep uh, connection to the ontologies and, and epistemologies. And so uh, someone who's written about this at a great length is Sundar Sarukai in, in Bangalore, who's written about the science and the ethics of curiosity, and he just rubs in what a lot of cultural theorists have emphasized, that curiosity is embodied, it's enacted, it's cultural, it's social, it's collective. And so what I want to claim today is that artistic and scientific curiosity have overlapping but not identical areas of expertise. 
They drive research in different directions and they have different value systems. And I think that's one of the things that makes it interesting to have the arts and sciences work together is to exploit those differences. On what path then does curiosity take us? So in this graph on the bottom axis is the scale, our size in the middle, small to large. On the other axis is uh, time, slow things, first things. And in the middle, that black circle is the area of the world accessible with our human senses. We're about a meter tall. We can see things, as Linda, uh, Lisa said yesterday, between a millimeter and a few kilometers. We live 70 years. We can remember things maybe from the age of five to the age of 70. To understand the world, we have to move outside of that black circle. Now, of course, CERN has driven us to the first and small. As an astronomer, I've driven us to the slow and large. But let me tell you, that parameter is, is huge. Curiosity could drive us in many different directions, and I could put other things on those axes. We've only just begun to explore that parameter space. And as uh, Zeitlinger said yesterday, we have no proof that the scientific models we have today are a unique solution to explaining the world. They may be one of many possible sciences that may develop in the future. Another way of showing this is just looking, uh, this is a, a representation of network knowledge, looking at the link between disciplines and publications and so on. And you can see that if you look at our knowledge systems, they're not uniformly dense. There are some areas we look at in great detail and other areas very little. Uh, in yellow, that's maybe the medical research cluster. We're very interested in what makes human beings survive and how to make them better when they're sick. But there are other parts of that knowledge network that have barely been investigated. Uh, and so curiosity can drive us in many different directions, and artists and scientists would drive us in that network in different ways. And so I'd like to argue uh, that the art science collaboration is really a translation problem. There are some things that are easily translatable, some things that are untranslatable. There are false friends that sound like they've been translated, but in fact give you totally misleading conclusions. Um, and the art and science, I think the richness of the, the reason for making them a couple is that they are epistemologically different terrains. Uh, in recent uh, decades, there's been a lot of work in what's called translation studies, and I want to argue that art and science are different cultures as different as Japan uh, and Austria, we don't want to merge those cultures. We want to find ways for them to interact together. And so, of course, translation techniques have been applied not only in text translation, but of course in remediation as you translate from one medium to another, intercultural translation, interdisciplinary translation. The act of translation in itself is necessarily an act of transgression because you go from your culture to another culture and that means it is a transgressive process, and you need to exploit that. Just one example of someone, who, an artist who I think has uh, done this kind of transgression is uh, Rachel Nyeri, who I think is, ex is here in one of the exhibitions, who works with primatology labs. She's a visual art artist, and she wants to make art for non-human primates. Not a fundable proposition. She has made art for non-human primates, and she's interested in exploiting the difference in cognitive systems of macaque, monkeys, baboons, human beings, and surprise, surprise, they don't see the world the same way. Their visual systems are different, their sound systems are different, their attention spans are different. Translating a work of art from a human culture to a macaque culture is a very difficult task and a very interesting task, and it's a transgressive task. I think it's interesting to do that kind of work because it brings to the fore certain issues that the scientists would not. Of course, we're interested in animal models and in human research, but only if the animal has the same disease as us because that's why they're interesting. Uh, through uh, funding, uh, through the Wellcome Trust and with Arts Catalyst, she's been able to continue that work, and I think uh, it's a very interesting area of art science collaboration. Um, Unfortunately, sex and violence seem to be universal volumes of values across primates. Uh, so those are translatable. So I want to argue very strongly that third culture is not an option. Um, some people in our community talk about a new syncretism. 
I don't think it's feasible or desirable. Jean-Marc Le Leblanc, in a recent book called Science is Not Art, has really rubbed this in with a number of detailed arguments. I don't think our goal is to create a third culture, but to find a ways to network our culture in a way so that indeed this innovation can happen in new kinds of ways. Example of an artist uh, group that's been doing this kind of work, this was for the Leonardo Lovely Weather Project uh, in Ireland run by Anique Bureau, uh, Soft Day. Uh, they work with marine biolog biologists and oceanographers who take data on what are called dead zones in the oceans where the ecology is so destroyed by the human activity that nothing is growing. They took that scientific data as the source uh, for comp uh, music composition and for performances worked with the local community, and that translation process was amazingly enriching, powerful. We're all worried about what we're doing to the planet, and somehow that music addressed uh, th those concerns. Another example is the Japanese artist Setsuko Ishiguro, uh, who's worked on the Flying Deities project for a number of years. Of course, that's a religious and cultural meme that in, originated in Buddhist India, uh, moved to China and to Japan, and what uh, Ishiguro has done is to move it into zero gravity. He's translated a cultural meme that is hundreds if not thousands of years old, remediated it into zero gravity, and it, that act of translation has pushed uh, research in zero gravity in interesting directions because it asks questions that scientists would not normally ask. Finally, why we want more earth science interaction is because we don't have a choice. There are certain problems in our society today that are so tough, we need to change our culture to resolve them. Climate change, we've got to couple the science and technology to the way we live. That's a cultural problem, and we need artists working on that with the scientists every day of the next decade, next century, if we survive it. There are certain problems where we cannot cloister the scientific activity in the scientific world, and I think uh, we really need to break the model. I wish CERN, when they'd been discussing uh, the risks, had done that in an open societal context and not just within the CERN context. So let me just come back uh, to something that was just discussed by Rolf and Yoichi, which is the innovation uh, question. Back in 1970, the world was really kind of simple. You funded basic research, then you got some engineers to apply it, you patented it, you licensed it, companies developed it, jobs were created, and the world was a better place. That happens occasionally, maybe once in 10,000 times, if you're lucky. And one of the basic problems, it, in, it ignores the cultural context of innovation. And so, indeed, the model today is much more of an ecological model where indeed there are universities and governments and corporations, but artists, NGOs, the public sector are part of that ecology, and what you need is to find accelerators so that you can flow through that ecology. Sometimes that's people, people like Michael Neymark, who go from the nonprofit to the for-profit world all the time. Sometimes it's small organizations, temporary autonomous zones, remember those in the 1980s, which are agile and can reorganize and refocus on problems. And so indeed, as we talk about earth science collaboration, we need to look at this ecology, and what I've been doing in the last couple of years uh, has been trying to set up some of those places. The first is the Mediterranean Institute for Advanced Study in Marseille. I'm part of the steering committee. Our logo is the human condition of the sciences. We don't think you can se separate science from society, and we need to refocus that. And it's an international residency program for scientists, artists, humanity scholars, uh, of all types, and we accept both individuals and pluridisciplinary groups. It's within a very traditional university structure, but it's a risk-taking organization. One of the themes that we've been working on is the issue of transgression of borders, looking at how the different sciences are shifting borders uh, and uh, transgressing the meaning of those borders. Uh, the, the three areas that, uh, that of course, uh, come to mind are biometrics and the definition of what it is to be human, uh, and control of that by uh, our, our societies. It's network science, which is teaching us a lot about other, why, other ways of thinking about frontiers and borders, borders of the real, the whole issue of, of virtuality. On the left is the work of uh, a French filmmaker, Harold Vasselin, 
who worked at our local climate change observatory installing artistic sensors side by side with the sensors of scientists, drawing his own meaning from what was going on. Another example is the work of Chiru Katuto and team who are here actually uh, here today. Uh, they work on modeling complex network phenomena in systems that entangle technological and social factors. But as part of their methodology, they've always included media artists and designers in their process, and they have chosen to show their work not only in traditional scientific venues, but also in art and science museums. And what they have been finding, I think, is that as an innovation tactic, it's amazingly successful. Very interesting work. Finally, uh, I just spent the month of August in Dallas, Texas, beginning to set up an art science program there uh, on, a, on a very large art and technology program there. There we're focusing on the areas of big data, which is overwhelming every area of the arts and humanities at the moment. Obviously, pop popular culture, but also science. CERN, of course, has been in the, in the vanguard of developing these technologies. And we're particularly interested in issues such as the technologies of attention, when you're immersed in a data flood, what do you decide what to pay attention to? Our brain is really good at that, but it's never been flooded with the kind of data that we're getting now. The whole issue of systems of representation, I chose to show you sonifications of the universe. They're equally valid to their visualizations because they're fictions. They're translations of scientific data into other forms that lie and they lie in certain ways better than others. And so the whole issue of system of representations is a key issue. Uh, and then the, the issue of the boundaries of the real. The second area is the whole area of virtual beings, not only virtual humans in Hollywood, but also how we behave online and how online beings affect physical beings. Very rich areas of research, and we'll be working in a different mode uh, at that university. And so I just want to conclude my comments there. I think I'm out of time. Um, I think it's a dangerous time we live in, I think it's really important that we find new ways to couple science to society. Part of that, I think, is having artists and scientists working together in innovation centers, uh, whether they, they be the media, my MIT Media Lab or the smaller places like Arts Catalyst or Symbiotica that we're going to hear about later. Uh, we need uh, mo mobile, uh, aggressive, reactive ways uh, of creating these kinds of new approaches. Uh, and so um, I look forward to coming back to Ars Electronica in 10 years and see how these endeavors have succeeded in coming up with new ideas. Thank you. Well, thank you, Roger, for making very clear that connection between art and science that you have been defending for over 25 years. I would like to pick a fight with you, but we don't have the time to do that when you talked about the wrong scale. I think we have time for just one question because we won't be able to have the question and answer at the end. So maybe one question. There's one right there. Or this one first. You had, didn't have a chance yet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, of the universe, Big Bang, and a second example of another development of the universe. I uh, like when you take a photograph or film, you have to choose a point of view. When you make a sound record, you have to choose a point of listening. So I wonder from which point of listening did you record those two samples? And what thoughts or reasonings uh, did you have uh, concerning locating that point of uh, listening in both time and space? Okay. First comment, that work is not my work of sonification, it's that of Frank Winter. If you Google sonify the Big Bang, you'll find it right away. The second comment is it's not sound, right? It's a sonification of data. There is no sound in the Big Bang because there are no pressure waves uh, in, 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 the, in the plasma. And so it's, a, it's not sound, it's a sonification. So I want to make sure there's no misunderstanding there. I think what's interesting is that visual cognition and oral cognition have different pattern recognition systems. 
And so indeed, sound and vision emphasize certain kind of ways that the mind finds connections between things. And so indeed, uh, the evolution of the universe uh, sequence that I showed you, you get very att attuned to discontinuities and certain kinds of changes in, in, the, in, the, in the simulation data, which maybe in the visual data you wouldn't be. And so I think the argument there is indeed, uh, if you use different techniques for representing the data, it gives you uh, other entry points into what's interesting in that data. Now, the other part of that is what you suppress. Of course, when you sonify the data, you have a high band pulse and a low band pulse, and you filter the data in a certain kind of way. With visual data, you do the filtering in a different way. It's often it's structural filtering rather than temporal filtering. filtering. And so indeed, those different techniques uh, actually lead you uh, to think differently about what's interesting in the data. Now, of course, there are other ways of looking at the data that have nothing to do with uh, making them accessible to the senses. And so it's also interesting to look at the structure of the data using algorithms and so on. And so I think the, the, the main point is to diversify the ways that you look at and think about data uh, and, and get away from this idea that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the data and the image.